It is such an well, that was, to have you today. It's good to be here, June. Thank you so much. Let me get this adjusted yes. just a little bit. Go ahead. I'm going to talk to the bride while you're doing that. Good afternoon, bride. Good afternoon on this beautiful Saturday. Look, can you believe that we are going into October already? Does it not seem like this year has flew by? It sure has. Listen, bride, you can check out all these Bride Time Live shows on our website, watb.tv. Also, this broadcast will be converted into a radio show, which will be featured on WATB Radio, which you can find at watbradio.com. Okay, Bride, listen, you can find out more about our ministry at wearethebride.us. Okay, now listen, sir, I would love for you to tell everybody, where are you from? Where are you at right now? Right now, I'm in um, probably about 70 miles outside of D.C., west of D.C. I live in the hills of Virginia. All right. <laughs> born, born and raised in Virginia, what so, yes. Hey, are, yes. are you having the after effects of the storm right now, or what? No, but we did have, when it comes through, we, we had a lot of rain. Uh, a, lot, a lot of local flooding that wasn't too devastating, but it, it could have been a lot worse. We kind of dodged a bullet on that one. I bet. Uh, well, let me ask you, Marty, can you tell them before we even get started on anything? First, can you lead us in prayer? And second, yes. I would love for you to tell us how they can find out more about your ministry before we get started. So if you would lead us in prayer, sir, we would be honored. Absolutely. Let's pray. Okay. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this time with June and the audience. And Lord, I pray that as we speak of the things that you have done in our lives and shown us, Lord, that only one name will be lifted up, and that is the name of yes. Jesus. Lord, I pray that you minister to your people. Yes. God, I pray that you bring strength to your people. Lord, I pray that you even cause the lost to see or hear this yes. and know that they need to redeem the time that we're living in right now. Yes. And Lord, I pray for an anointing upon June, upon myself. God, I pray that we glorify your name, bless our time together, bless our fellowship as we lift up your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yes. Now listen, Brad, I want you to know we did try to do this, uh, you know, where he could be even with me. So I want you to know we did try that, but we just could not work it out today. So I want you to know that. Okay, sir, can you tell them a little bit about uh, your ministry, how they can find out more about you before we get started. Yes, ma'am. Um, right now, the biggest ministry that I have has really been through Facebook. Um, I've done a lot of interviews with uh, a lot of the ministries over the, over the last few years now, and people will go to my Facebook page. Uh, site uh, just at Marty Breeden yeah. and um, just getting ready to start off in uh, evangelistic work. I'm going to be going out uh, to churches that are open and also going to be doing some evangelism uh, outside of the church walls as well. Okay now before we get started in me asking questions I want to give the uh, bride a few instructions for the broadcast today. This broadcast I do have permission from Mr. Breeden for us to make this an interactive broadcast. But what I do ask is if you can wait until the end uh, before you ask questions, he will be happy uh, to answer any questions. But I would like to read you his bio so that you that don't know him can get to know him a little bit. After going code blue twice in July of 2015 from acute respiratory failure, and an extended hospital stay, including three weeks in the critical care unit, several weeks in progressive care, then moved to the University of Virginia Transitional Care Facility to learn how to walk, talk, and swallow again, and four months of home recovery. Wow, Marty. Marty Breeden returned from death's final door and shares the stirring messages and warnings he received from the Lord Jesus personally. He knows the return of Christ is nearer than most believe. 
Marty is a retired deputy sheriff in Page County, Virginia, where he is married to his wife of 25 years, Diana, and he resides in the Shenandoah Valley. Marty has two daughters, Mallory and Mathia, and he has recently started doing outreach ministry through evangelism, sharing his testimony and other messages concerning end time events and the lateness of the hour. Wow, wow, you have been through it, sir. I have. It's been quite a journey. Um, I was um, I was raised like most of the people um, in my circle, raised in church. I tell people I was raised in an Assembly of God church where I grew up, and mm -hmm. it, but it was more of a Pentecostal holiness church. I tell everyone jokingly, but somewhat true. I say I, I grew up in a church that yes, you wanted your friends to get saved, but not necessarily in your church. <laughs> Because you weren't always, <laughs> you weren't always for sure what was going to happen. <laughs> that is funny. So, so I come to know the Lord, um, really dedicate my life to the Lord when I was 17 and made a strong commitment and followed the Lord for many years, June. And as life can have it, um, our walk with the Lord sometimes will vacillate, will be strong, and then will be weak. And I went through a lot of that. Years I would walk very close to the Lord. Then I would seem to, to slip away. And eventually I got involved in law enforcement. And um, that, that was good and bad. I learned a lot about, about life. I learned a lot about uh, the times that we're living in. Uh, but the stressors of the job itself began to take a huge toll on me after many years. And I began to have a decline in my health. Uh, at this point, I was really running from the Lord. I'd allowed my walk with God to slip quite a bit. And so I, um, I became really to a place where I had a lot of depression and anxiety, and I would begin to self-medicate, and I would begin to drink. And I really took my hand off the plow when it came to my walk with the Lord. And I never did these things on duty, but I worked hard, and then afterwards, I played hard. Yeah. Um, so, so what happened was, uh, according to the doctors, really the perfect storm came about because um, I was drinking. I had undiagnosed sleep apnea. I had, um, I was at the time, I was in congestive heart failure. I did not know it. I had uh, double pneumonia. And what I didn't understand was that during this process, what was coming down was there was a, a CO2 buildup in my system that I was not aware of. And uh, it began to get worse and worse. And I woke up one morning and my wife said, you don't look good. You need to go to the doctor. And I'd been having some trouble with my breathing. And she said, when I said, okay, she knew something was wrong. Because as a cop, of course, we're 10 feet tall and bulletproof and we don't need to go to the doctor. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I needed, I needed to go. So I, I, we took us uh, to Centera uh, RMH, uh, which is in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And when we walked in, uh, everything just began to change. They started running tests on me. Uh, they come back and they told my wife, they said, we're not for sure uh, if he's had a heart attack, is going to have a heart attack, if he's going to have a stroke. But the EKG and all the blood work, is off the charts. Wow. Uh, they said the, they said the bot, the top chamber of my heart, uh, I went into atrial flutter. Uh, they said the top chamber of my heart was beating 150 beats a minute and the bottom chamber was probably double that. Wow. Uh, I could have went into cardiac arrest at any time. But so they told my wife after we were there for a few hours, they said, uh, and I remember very little of this part. Uh, later on, my wife would, would tell me what had happened because after the CO2 got to a certain place, I just, I just really blocked out. And they told my wife, they said, we cannot seem to keep him stable, even here in the ER. And what we're going to do is we're going to move him to a room in the critical care unit and see if we can stabilize him a little better there. Yeah. So they told my wife to step outside of the room for a few minutes. And she and my mom stepped outside the room and she said, 
within a matter of minutes, they told her they would let her know when they had had me up in CCU and she could come up. Yeah. She said, but when I walked out of the room, when they walked out of the room, she said, within a matter of a few minutes, all across the hospital, there came a tone. And it said, code blue, code blue, code blue, just like it does in the hospitals, ringing oh. out, ringing throughout the hospital. My wife said she looked at mom and said, I hope that's not Marty. Um, and the fact is, it was me. I, I totally stopped breathing. I had to have emergency trach surgery um, uh, just to sustain my life. Um, so it was, it was quite, quite an event. I, I was in the hospital, uh, as you said, for, in the critical care unit on life support for three weeks, uh, was able to survive, went to progressive care, and ultimately had to go to the UVA transitional care facility, learn how to, how to walk, talk, and swallow again, and four months of in-home treatment. Um, but the interesting thing is, is when this happened, June, I was not in a real good place with God. I, I, I was like some Christians. I, I lived a life of repentance. I had allowed things to come into my life, yeah. and I would be like, I would know that it wasn't right. I would say, Lord, forgive me. So the Lord knew my heart, but the interesting thing is when I coded, immediately when I coded, I found myself, you know, the Bible says to be absent from the body yeah. is to be present with the Lord. Yes. And when I, co when I coded June, I went through a tunnel faster than what I can possibly describe. And I've been a police officer for many years. I know what it's like to go fast. There's nothing to compare this to. Right. And I went through this tunnel and then I came out and I was in the presence of the Lord. And the Lord could have said a million things to me. He could have said, you shouldn't have done this, or you shouldn't have done that, or where. He could have said a million things to me. But what he said actually, actually shocked me and surprised me. He looked at me and he said, my church does not really believe that I'm coming back soon. And I, I stood there in stunned silence. And then he said it again. My church does not really believe that I'm coming back soon. Oh. And, and yet again, for a third time, he would say it. My church does not really believe that I'm coming back soon. At this point, um, every time the Lord would say it, he would say it with more volume. And you, you could tell he was more serious every time he said it. And at this point, I was almost like a school child. I was, I literally lifted up my hand trying to get his attention. I said, I said, Lord, I said, yes, we do. We do believe you're coming back soon. Lord, we, we study about it. We sing about it. We pray about it. Uh, we believe you're coming back soon, Lord. Yeah. And then he said, my church does not really believe I'm coming back soon. He said, for if they did, they would not be living as they are. Oh. And then he pointed his finger at me, not in a mean way, but he wanted to get his point across. And he said, he said, I am coming back soon. And my church is not ready. He said, now go back and tell the things that you've heard and know that your message will not be received. That, wow. So I, immediately then I came back into my body. Um, I didn't realize and how significant the last thing the Lord said. You're not even living right. You're not even no, exactly. living right. Wow. But the Lord knew my heart. Amen. Wow. He's a merciful God. Yes. He's a merciful God. Yes. So from there, uh, there was, it was a long recovery. There was other things that I saw uh, that I don't talk about a lot, but my wife told me um, in the critical care unit, she said, when I first awoke and first was able to, to have a little bit of uh, contact and talk a little bit, and I had a speaking apparatus that they put on, she said, one of the first things I ask is, where are all the people in the white robes? What? Because I have oh. seen a part, a portion of heaven with rolling green hills and people in white robes, and the look on their face is unimaginable. Yes. And it's hard to come back once you see something like that. Yes. You want to stay. You want to stay. But the Lord sent me back with this message, June, and I have been as faithful to uh, tell this uh, to 
individuals and groups of people uh, as I can. I mean, I, I'm very, I try to share this uh, with any one that, that will listen. Um, and I've seen the Lord draw people, uh, the backsliders home. I've seen him uh, save souls through this. But the story doesn't, doesn't stop there. It actually gets pretty interesting. When, when I came through and after I, I came out of critical care and then I went through progressive care and they sent me to the University of Virginia, uh, my first night there, I had, as the Apostle Paul said, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. But I don't know if it was a dream or a vision. I know what only thing I know is what I saw. But, but I, I saw an, like a, an oval-shaped light about this big, and then it began to get bigger and bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter and brighter. And all of a sudden, in this vision, I see myself standing in the middle of a football stadium. Hmm. I see a football on the two-yard line. I look up at the scoreboard, and it says 213. And immediately, that same voice that I knew so well from having experienced uh, the, the first code blue, that same voice of the Lord said to me, my church should be living as though this is the two minute warning. Wow. Now God wow. knew that I would know exactly what that meant because God knows how to speak yeah. to each one of us and it makes sense. And I'm a huge football fan. Yes. So God knew, God knew that, uh, that I would be um, understanding the, the, the gravity of that statement, my church should be living as though this is a two-minute warning, that last 120 seconds in a football game yeah. can determine victory or defeat. It also means that the referee is getting ready to blow the whistle, and the game is about to be over. Jesus. And, you know, if you, in that last two minutes, <clears throat> in, that, in that last two minutes, excuse me, June, <clears throat> it's very important because if you're winning the game, you don't want to give up any ground and you don't want to allow the opposition to score. You want to hold your ground. But if you're not winning, you want to do everything you can to progress that ball downfield and try to get it in the end zone to score. Yeah. So the Lord knew that I would understand exactly yeah. what he meant. Now, this happened the first night that I was in there. So at this point in time, I was still in a wheelchair. I couldn't walk. Wow. And the next morning... The next morning, um, just a few hours after I had had this vision, the next morning there was a, um, a knock at my door. Uh, and I said, come in as best I could. I still had a speaking apparatus on. And two ladies walked in and they introduced themselves as um, one would be my physical therapist and the other one would be my occupational therapist. And they said, they, they wanted to talk with me. And I said, I said, okay. So we began to talk about treatments and uh, things that would, that would happen while I was there to try to get me to walk again, to try to get me back on my feet. Yeah. And they, would, um, they, they, they began to go over the plan that they would have for me in the hospital. And then suddenly the conversation took a very odd turn. One of the young ladies looked at me and she said, Mr. Breeden, can I ask you a personal question? Oh, no. And, <laughs> and I said, I said, sure, you can. And she said, would you consider yourself a man of faith? Wow. And I said, and I said, well, I certainly haven't always lived it. Yeah. And I said, I've failed, I've failed many times. I said, but this has been such a humbling experience. And I said, I said, yes, I'm a Christian. I do, I, I, I've given my heart to the Lord. I said, and after everything that I've been through now, there, there's no turning back. When I said that, she looked at the other lady and they looked at each other and they smiled at each other. And I said, I said, ladies, I'm not at all offended by your question. Yeah. I said, that's kind, of, that's kind of an odd question for an occupational therapist and a physical therapist to, um, to ask a patient, isn't it? And she said this. And this this can be verified. This 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 seems almost too fantastic to be true. Yeah. But she said she said, Mr. Breeden, we had no intentions of coming in to see you this morning. She said we were we were both walking down the hall going in separate directions 
going to see other patients. She said, we weren't supposed to come in and see you for a few days. She said, but as we were walking in the hall and we both passed by your door, she said, superimposed, supernaturally in the spirit, we saw the number two on your door. Aww. And she said, we're both spirit-filled Christians. And she said, I asked the Lord, what is that? And he said, go in and ask that man if he knows what the number two means, <laughs> and he'll know exactly what you're talking about. My goodness. There is no way, June, in a million years, that they could have known four hours prior that I had had this vision yeah. of the Lord telling me, telling me that we were in the two minute morning. So she said, what does that mean? And I said, that means he's coming back and the church should be in the two minute warning. And it was a powerful time and we rejoiced, we rejoiced in the Lord. And, and she, one of the ladies spoke prophetically over me about some things that would happen uh, once I got out of the hospital and I have seen those things come to pass and you know it was it was really odd June because the first when I first come out of the hospital I um I felt in, instead of taking this public this experience I shared it with my family but I went to pastors and began to to share what had happened yeah. and the message that the Lord had given me yeah. as he told me to and it was flat out rejected what are you he told me one of, the last, <laughs> one of the last things he told me in the when I coded, he said, "Go back and tell the things that you have heard, and know that your message will not be received." Wow. Well, I, I thought maybe that might have been not received from the world, but it was not received by the church. I probably wow. told over fifty what? pastors. I probably told over fifty pastors the first year, and every single one of them just looked at me like I had a third eye. Wow. They did not. They did not want to hear that. So, after a while, God began to break down the barriers and began to open some doors, and yeah. some people uh, began to hear about. I started sharing with some people, and then doors began to open. Some some other ministries began to ask me to to come on and share. And, and as a matter of fact, one ministry said the story seems so fa fantastic that in order for us to carry it. Uh, we really need to verify whether these things are true. Wow. And I actually had to sign off for, the, for them to, and they actually spoke to the physical therapist uh, who saw the number two on my door. They spoke to my doctors. I let them see my medical records and everything that I went through uh, was true. Now, he, now, here's what's interesting, and I'll wind this part of it up, and then we'll talk about some other things. But when I was home recovering, when I was home recovering, I, I sat one day with, with the word and I said, God, there's one thing that I don't understand about the two minute warning, the vision when I was in, in Charlottesville, Lord, I, it's one thing that's it's kind of bugged me. And, and will you help me understand yeah. this? I said, I understand the two minute warning. I, I know what that means. I said, but when I looked at that clock, it said two thirteen. Yeah. What is and I said, I said, what is, why, why 213? Why not two minutes? Yeah. So I, I opened my Bible, I opened my Bible and I, I heard the spirit of God say, son, turn to the book of Titus. Wow. So I opened, I opened my Bible to Titus and I heard him say the same spirit of the Lord that spoke to me. He said, turn to Titus 213. Here's what it says in the King James Version, Titus 2, 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you, in a million years, you can't make no, that up. No, you can't. No, you cannot. And, and I just say glory to God. That, that, that should give us an idea June of how close we are. And that was three years ago. If we were in the two minute warning on July 17th, 2015, if we were, if we were in that two warning minute warning, then how much closer are we now? I know. And I've just got to stop right here, Marty. We just met this year. We don't really know each other, but I've interviewed over, I mean, hundreds of ministers. And I interviewed this guy one time that had sort of the same experience you did and he had the same experience where God told him to warn people. 
And he uh, said that he had a vision whenever he died. He had a vision of uh, the day of the Lord. God showed him in a vision. And listen, it was so terrible that people were literally peeling their skin off with their hands and like just the oh. horror of, of him appearing, the glory of him just made people just cringe and want to just, you know, like the, the Bible, it describes it as weeping and gnashing of teeth. I mean, right. because, you right. know, his glory, he cannot be around sin. You know, just the glory, and the I just can't imagine like what you really experienced, or I really can't. Well, you know, I've had several people ask questions like, "Well, are you saying that you saw God?" Absolutely not. I was in His presence. Right. There was no way that I could look. No way that I could look upon that glory. I could. There's no way. You, you know, no no man can see God and live. And right. and I could I could see I could see the outline and I could see the glory, but I. No, I, I, I couldn't see God. Yeah. And no man, but the pre, when, when you're in that presence and you're standing in the midst of that holiness, it is beyond any earthly vernacular or language yeah. to describe standing in that type of power and in that type of presence. Well, that was and, the question and so, I was going to ask you, Marty, is when you were standing there in his presence, like I know you heard his voice saying, you know, tell them I'm coming back. What, what what was your body, like, how was your body reacting to this? Because obviously uh, you knew how serious he meant it, but, what, but for yourself as a human, what was you feeling when he was saying it? Because to me, that's all a part of the message. It is, you know, I was so fascinated and so caught up in the moment that I didn't know anything about my body. I was so fixed, transfixed on hearing what he had to say. You know, the Bible says that his voice is the sound of many waters. Yeah. And that's true. Oh. When he speaks, you know it. And, and there's nothing else that you want to concentrate on except exactly what he is saying. And, uh -huh. and he spoke that to me. And it, it, it changed. It changed my life. It changed it changed my heart. Most people who know me will tell you when I when I came out of that, um, you know, before I left UVA, and this is this is something I do not want to neglect to leave out because I think this is one of the more beautiful parts. And you're gonna to have to forgive me. That's all right. But I was in a wheelchair, and I remember the first time June that they allowed me to go outside. They pushed me out. And I had already, I had already had my, my code blue. I had already coded twice. I'd had my experience with the Lord. I'd had the vision uh, of being in the football uh, stadium. And, but still, I, my heart grieved because I, I got outside and I started looking around and everything, the sky looked bluer, the grass looked greener, everything looked just this fresh, clean. And I remember in shame, because I had fallen so far out of the will of God, oh. in shame. I literally dropped my head and I said, oh, God. I said, what happened? And all he said was, son, just come back and do what I've called you to do. Oh, that's beautiful. And I, I know what he has called me to do is to share this message, but also now we're going to be launching out into evangelistic ministry uh, when doors uh open to preach in church or a community center or just a gathering of believers uh we're we're looking forward uh to what the lord has in store june because i believe us to be living uh in the last hours of the last days everything is is lining up yeah. you know since this event ha since this event happened uh, i have had um it's hard to say how many dreams that i've had the lord I know. speak to me Amazing. Often at, often at nighttime, June, the Lord will speak, and and you know, I, I'm I'm, I'm always careful because when people say the Lord said or the Lord showed me, we we know that it has to be biblical. It has to line up with what the Word says. Um, anything when if someone says they've had a dream or a vision and it violates the Word of God in any way, then 
toss it out. It's no good. Yeah. But <clears throat> I so, but I, the dreams that I have are often very, very troubling. Um, and it often foretells a time that uh, I believe is yet to come. Yeah. And I think America, I think America, June, is going to see some hard days ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for that blessed hope. I'm waiting for the trumpet to sound that I think could sound at any moment. But at the same time, I'm telling my Christian brethren, be prepared because we're going to see some hard times. I think we're going to see uh, persecution. Yeah. That's going to happen. And I think we can see the beginning of that now. Um, but a lot of the, the dreams that I have, June, are apocalyptic in nature. And this is not to, not to strike fear in the heart of people. Right. But and I and I make no I make no professions. I mean, let me make make sure people understand. I am not a prophet. Yeah. I do not make any profession to be anything other than a retired police officer and someone who tries to hear from the Lord and tries to be obedient when I have heard. But the dreams that I'm having are very very concerning, and they're often in in, in conjunction with other people, credible people of God. You know, I had a dream the other night even when uh, just just a few weeks back actually. And that same night, Paul Begley had had almost the identical dream. Yeah. Another woman had had a dream. He had me. He brought me on his show because our dreams were so similar, and 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 we we had them on the exact same day within hours hours apart. And what was that? So God is. I don't. Um, I would have to go back and, and pull that yeah. up. There's been there's been so many, so many, but it was it was about an um, about a storm that is coming upon the land. Yeah. And it was about an unexpected, unexpected storm and how families began to gather and how families saw what was coming on the horizon, but yet some people were prepared and others were, were not prepared, but it hit suddenly. That was the thing that was so striking about, about the dream. We, we, saw, we saw the skies begin to, uh, begin to get very dark and the wind began to swirl. And then before you knew it, there the storm was, just unimaginable proportions. And when I looked out over the landscape, it just looked absolutely desolate. Yeah. And um, it, it was it was very sobering, very sobering dream. Now, Marty, you don't know this, but there's a minister watching this broadcast. Hello, Miss Robin. Uh, Robin has a television show where she features uh, people that have these dreams. Uh, she is watching right now. So can you explain to like the bride, can you explain to her when you have these dreams, uh, are you watching like a video screen or are you like actually in the dream or do you see what I mean? What is it? That's like? a great question. That's a great question. I, 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 when I have these dreams, I am living them. Um, I am right there. It's not like something that I'm seeing taking place on a TV screen. I am right. The, the way the Lord shows me is I am just right there in the middle of this. Okay. Um, when, I, when I'm, I'm seeing something, I, it's happening around me. And I, and I find that, that the Lord will, will show me things. I say he often speaks to us by using association. He may speak one thing to you, June, and another to me, and it'll be the same thing, but he'll show us in ways that he knows that yeah. we will understand. Yes. And so, you know, I've had some, some dreams recently that, that, are, that are very concerning. Um, in fact, I would like to share one of those. Yes. That's please. okay. Um, this is fairly recent. Uh, on September 24th, 2018, uh, I had a dream concerning mass casualty. And I'll just read what I, what I wrote. Yes. Last night I had a dream of what appeared to be a mass casualty type of event. It seemed as though the entire hospital was on lockdown with the exception of those being brought in through the emergency room. I noticed as I walked through the hallways that I saw an unusual amount of hospital staff, doctors, surgeons, specialists, nurses, nurses, aides, and what appeared to be cleanup crews of some type. I would pass by one room and I would hear families talking of how they had lost loved ones and how they were grieving deeply. It was hard to hear. What was most striking about the dream was the look of total and complete exhaustion on the faces of the physicians and oh. all of the staff, they looked completely worn out as they would sit and hang their heads in total fatigue. 
In fact, they all looked themselves as though they needed to be in the hospital or see a physician themselves. Mm -hmm. I then saw families gathering at particular parts of the hospital on a lower level, and they were receiving counsel and comfort, almost like group therapy. I knew that whatever had happened was on a very large scale, and the medical staff in the hospital was not prepared for what had come. Even at times, I did in fact see some of the physicians attending to one another. Wow. I think that's the real. Most of them looked tired and sickly, and it was heartbreaking to see. There's other, other things, dreams that I've had um, that I think that when I think it's entirely possible uh, that this nation is, is going to, we're going to be at war at some time, and at some point we're going to get hit, and it's going to be suddenly, and we're not going to be prepared. I would like for you and to the church share the dream about the wolf, the three storms, and they were they were uh, like one behind another, and then the final one was the wolf. I'm telling you, Brad, the, his dreams. Are, it's almost like every day when you get these dreams, it's almost like we're reading a book. You know, I don't know if all of you watch him feel that way when you uh, read his post. I mean, he's first of all, your writing is beautiful. As a writer, I really admire your writing style. I told you this in private. Uh, and then the pictures that you use are very, uh, they match your vision very well. And so, um, I mean, I just want you to see if you can remember that about the wolf. I, I do. I did uh, I out hey mark breaking up real quick you're breaking up yeah i think you're i think you're freezing Oh, he. Uh, you're coming back. Okay. Hopefully, he can get in a better uh, connection area or something. Mar Marty, for some okay, he's going to come back, Brad. Uh, to you that don't know Marty, you need to f either follow him or befriend him uh, on Facebook. His name is Marty Breenan, Breathing. And I'm, I'm telling you, Brad, I mean, I have a lot of dreams. That, psh, this man is like, I mean, this is his life. And he, he gives these dreams almost every day. Uh, where God, it's almost like God takes him in the future and shows him uh, these days to come when the judgment hits our country. And it is, I'm telling you, Brad, it's, a lot of his uh, dreams will just literally shock you. Yes, I consider him a prophet. He don't think he's one, but I think he's one. Uh, you can follow him on his Facebook, he said, at Marty Breeden. You can either follow him or you can ask him to be your friend. Yes, please, plead the blood. Can y'all hear me? Uh, Gracella is saying that they can't hear me. Can y'all hear me? It's coming and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. Amen. There you, breathing, B-R-E-E-D-E-N. His last name is B R E E D E N. Let's see if I can leave a comment. Let's see. Can y'all hear me? Okay, good. You can hear me. All right. Praying to be kind of worthy. Yes. Okay, let me see if I can leave a comment here. 
Oh, there it is. Okay. Marty. All right, there he is to all of you watching. I just posted it. Marty Breeden, and that's his name on Facebook. There it is. And you can, uh, you know, ask him to be your friend or follow him. Definitely follow him. Because his writing style is so amazing, Brad. Like, God, God gives him these dreams, and it's almost like he's writing a movie to show us in the future. You know, really. And so he should be back on in a moment. So get, bear with me just a moment. But what I'm going to do right now, Bride, is I'm going to read you. I'm going to look up that dream and read it to you. Listen, this one that he had about the wolf, this gives you an example of the, the writing style that he has. Yes, he does, Charlene. Yes. He does have a gift from God. Okay, Marty is back. All right. All right, Marty. Here we go. Thank you, Debbie. All right, Marty. I invited you, brother. Okay, I got a little notice here. Let's see. Oh. I invited you, Marty. Let's see here. Go. Yes, Marty, I did. And Marty, you should be able to ask to join back as well. Ask to join. Y'all, please pray for him. Okay, yes, it shows that I invited you. Yay, here he is. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Let it be. Let it be. Come on, Marty. Come back. Yay. Okay, here we go. Come on. There we go. Approve. Yay! Yes, Lord! Yes, bring him back, Lord. Mm, yes, yes. Yay! <laughs> Marty is back! Yes. Marty, we're so happy to have you back, brother. It is a black screen, though. It's a it's a black screen. Ask the people in your house. There he goes. He's gonna try again. Marty, if you're watching this broadcast, ask the people in the house to sign out so you can have all the. Uh, internet power in your house. Okay, I am going to, because you know what, Bride, when you're streaming like that, that's how it works. Marty, yay! All right, Marty. Let's do this. Okay, it's adding him all right. Yay! <laughs> Unbelievable. Let's try this. Yay! <laughs> You're back, brother. All right. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, if you have that dream, read that. If you have that dream, share okay, that. Wait one moment. All right, let's see. Marty, Breeden, Wolf. Dream. All right, Bride, here it is. Okay, I had this dream last night on March 11th of 2018. Please read it until the end. 
the dream I had last night will be difficult to share. Number one, because it was so dramatic to have seen this and be involved in. There you go. Uh, and two, the symbolism meanings are hard to capture. So as always, I will share what I saw and leave the timing and interpretation up to God. So here we go. This is a dream of overwhelming devastation times two. It was almost as though in both the natural and in the spirit, we were being warned. The people knew they had been warned. I knew I had been warned. I had been warned by God and had warned many others as instructed by God. It was almost like we were being foretold of that which was coming as we looked at the map. There was not a single state that was not affected by these approaching storms. From the West Coast to the East Coast to the Midlands, everyone would see devastation. Even now, I can see the map. I can see the swirling color, colors gathering. What I, is odd about it normally is that the meteorologist would show on the radar that which was coming in these different colors to minimize severity. They literally ran out of to be able to accurately describe that which was given. I can hear even now as they foretold and trying to tell the people, oh please, my God, prepare and know that even your preparation may not save you. Now, but with the poor we have called It's cutting out on my end. Okay. There it is it stopped. It stopped. Okay. okay. Thank you for telling us, Bride. Thank you. Okay, they said there were six storms coming. These storms had each been given names. This time, they were given names of animals and birds as to what, I mean, as to how each would affect the land and the people. Now, remember, Brad, he's saying that in this dream, that it is, that the, everybody in the country had already been warned. They already knew that judgment was coming. So when they saw the meteorologist giving this warning, they knew we knew we know why this is coming. Basically, is what he's saying. And it was so bad there was not enough colors. Okay, so he said we were told that the first storm would be as a bird, that it would peck away at everything and shake things mightily, but would also be used to deliver the message as in the days of old. I cannot recall the second storm's name. They told us that we would experience the end of all things when the wolf came, and it was the third storm. They showed us on the map through tears and stuttering and hanging their heads. They told us to prepare. One of the last things they said before they went off the air was, we really have nothing to compare this to. You must get ready because you have never seen anything like this before. That night it hit. Storm number one. No one could expect. I remember I could not get myself because it literally seemed to be both simultaneously. I don't know. I'm getting it on my end as well. The winds, the rain, the wreckage, everything. I recall watching the large trees bending under the weight of the wind and seeing the waters rising on the coast and seeing the heartland pounded by a mighty force. The next morning, just as it was named, it had pecked and shaken everything and word had indeed traveled across the country at the devastation that had occurred. Now it was time to move on to the next storm warning. This is where it gets tough. 
again, we looked at the map and literally we all gasped as we saw the size and scope of what was coming, knowing the magnitude of the first one. This time, all they would say was, we really don't know what to say or how to warn. Just prepare as the best you can. And the next day it hit. During the daylight hours, it came. It was really odd because you could see the storm clouds gathering and you could literally hear it coming. I remember seeing the looks of fear and dread on people's faces. Some people prayed and others checked their supplies. For one of the first times ever though, it seemed as though now everyone was taking the warnings to heart and there was little to no mockery the first storm had taken care of all that. The power by which the storm hit is truly unexplainable. Every foundation was shaken. Every room of every house had been moved. I saw naval destroyers literally capsized on dry ground far from the coast from where they had come. I saw death and destruction in unprecedented ways. There was not a single family, business, or church that had not been affected and devastated. I was thought back then that while it was happening, that I expected to be swept away any second. I expected to be standing before my Lord any moment. The cries of pain and heartache was nothing I want to hear again. Again! The wind, the rain, the shaking, the sounds of explosions and waters rising and the ground splitting and seeing ocean waters flowing through the rivers. I recall after storm number two, we're still in storm number two, Brad. What the hell? I recall after storm number two had hit thinking, now I know why Jesus said those days must be cut short. For if they were not, no flesh would be saved. I remember thinking, my God, this is only storm number two of six. All of humanity and all of the earth will be wiped out and earth disintegrate beneath our feet. Even those most prepared among us, many of them perished, for there appeared in most cases to be no escape. There were godly among us who have been taken, along with many of those who were not believers. I noticed, though, even as I surveyed the landscape the following day. Remember, Brian, this is still number two, right? Yes. Everything indeed had been shaken just as foretold by Christ. The one thing I saw that surprised me was that now it seemed there was very few, if any, who did not believe. Everyone was broken in a way unforeseen, a level of brokenness I had never witnessed ever. Amidst the tragedy and devastation and carnage, there arose a brokenness among the people, for they knew that it was only a matter of time. It was then that we gathered to hear the next forecast, and we were all so tired and weary but there was a deep work going on in the heart of man. God was at work. This is the wolf coming this time. As the forecaster took the stage, he was visibly shaken, but not in despondency this time. Something was different. He stood before the camera, gathering himself as best he could, and I heard him say these words, the people are repenting. The people are repenting. He then said, and it's because of this repentance that, well, look at these storms now. Yes, they're still coming, but they have been dramatically weakened and will not cause the devastation we had originally anticipated. The reporter wept on national television. I recall myself and all those around me weeping and praising God, me being me. My mind went immediately to, okay, it's time to gather the harvest. The fields are white unto harvest. Let us go forth now and bring them in. And then he woke up. Bam! 
Drop the mic. That is amazing. That's what I'm talking about, Bri, the kind of dreams he has. So when you have these types of dreams, do you get up and do you do you go in your phone and just start writing or do you literally just write them down or what? <laughs> When I when when I have these dreams, June, the first thing that I do is to be as accurate as I can and to record the smallest of details. I will go into the room and just lock myself there, and I will write down everything that I saw. With the Lord has blessed me that I have perfect recall. I can't often remember a conversation that I had with my wife or daughters the, the night prior, but yet I can recall wow. every small minute detail of that dream. Wow. And that's how, that's how it happens. And on that particular dream, honestly, and I'm not being uh, overly dramatic or embellishing this, it took about two days for me to recover from that just because it was so hard uh, because it was just as if I was in that right. storm. Just emotionally and physically, it took a lot out right. of me. And I, I've had other people say, boy, I wish I would have dreams like that. I wish the Lord would speak to me, to me in that way. And I'm like, careful what you ask for. <laughs> you know, careful. And I think, I think, I think, you know, even hearing you read back the dream, uh, it, it was hard, hard to hear again, but I think that many of us are going to see some of the most fruitful time in ministry and harvest in the midst of chaos. I do too. Yeah. I, th I think when, when, when things really, really get bad, that many of the proud and the haughty and those who would be arrogant or would turn against the things of the Lord, when they begin to see the things that are coming upon yeah. the earth, they're going to be a lot more open to the gospel, yeah. June, than what they are I now. I believe that with all my heart, Marty. And that's, uh, that's why it's so important, I think, and I, I didn't want to forget to say this, and I want to be aware of your time. The... Um, Whatever God has called you to do, be faithful in doing that now. It's never been more important than to be in the will of God than what it is right yeah. now. If, it, if he's called you to a small group of people, you know, whatever the Lord has laid on your heart to do, do it right. now. And now is an, we are so close. And, and you know, there, there are people far more qualified and, and a lot smarter than I am concerning biblical prophecy, but everything that's going on in the Middle East right now with with Russia yeah. and Syria and Iran and Israel and all and China and, and you know all the nations that's mentioned in Ezekiel thirty eight and thirty nine, we see all Turkey, we see all of these nations uh gathering uh, together against yeah. Israel and we see that uh, there's a lot going on over there. That is a tinderbox yeah. now and things could change in a moment. That's right. Well, Marty, I want to ask you something. Okay. With all of your dreams that you have, uh, I know people have asked you and said, you know, that they wish they had the dreams, but uh, they don't realize the responsibility that you have. And I do because of a dreamer myself, I recognize the uh, mantle that God has put on you, the responsibility of how to steward those dreams. I mean, dreams are not a small thing. I mean, look at the Bible. I mean, Joseph. Right. You know, you have all these people in the Bible that have had dreams, and God would change nations. He would change nations over dreams. So I don't, I don't think it's a small thing that God has given you this gift. Now, I know I want to ask this. Did you have dreams before your encounter? I did. I've had dreams ever since I was a child, uh, but not, not to this degree. Okay. Not, not to this degree. And, and you, you, you hit on something that I think needs to be okay. addressed. You know, a, a lot of people are, are, very, are very kind uh, and and they respond, you know, I will wake up some mornings after having some of these dreams that I have, and I will just say, oh, Lord, no, I, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to be doom and gloom. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't want say. people to, to see it that way. Yeah. Well, are you there? Yeah. Okay. And so, 
uh, but I have literally had Christians send me messages and say, don't send me any more of your doom and gloom dreams. I don't want to hear it anymore. And it's, it's odd because often it seems that the world, the unbelievers are more open sometimes to the things of God than those that are professing spirit-filled Christians. Right. And it, it is hard to write these yeah. things down. You know, it, it, is hard, it is hard to report some of these things that, that you right. see because, they're, you know, these are not the things that generate offerings <laughs> when you share this kind of stuff. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't have anything even set up to where someone can give like that anyway, so that's not even an, an issue with me. Uh, I, just, I just share what the Lord gives me, but it, it is. It's, it's very yeah. taxing emotionally. It's, it's taxing emotionally. And um, there are often times that I see things that I, that I do not want to. But, you know, at the same time, I understand what the Bible says. If, you know, I, I may be a watchman and just, just one of many, but I don't want to stand before the Lord and have blood required exactly. in my hands because I was unfaithful. Well, Marty, I want to say this. There's many watchmen on the wall that's watching right now. I see you all. Hello, Brother TD and everybody. Uh, listen. What I don't understand about the church not wanting to hear the harshness of the realities coming is how can you avoid it? I mean, it's been written. It is the word of God. We are in the end times. We are the generation that's going to see all this. So why are you scared to hear, uh, you know, what's coming so that you can be uh, what is that scripture that says, you know, oh, you know, sober and alert, sober and right. alert. And also we need to be aware of the times. And I want to say something to you, Brad, real quick. Uh, okay. What he is seeing, okay. Is a time in the future that's coming. We don't know if it's tomorrow or five years or 10 years or a month, but here's the thing. I'm 50. Do you know that when I was a little girl, I look back in my memory, I look back in time, and it seems like yesterday? Do you know that I cannot hardly believe I'm 50? Because in my spirit, I still feel, you know, 16. I still feel very young. And do you know I asked a 99-year-old woman this one time, because I've been with a lot of people on their deathbed, a lot of elderly and I asked her, I said, ma'am, I've got a question. I'm 40 years old. But in my body, I feel 40. But in my heart, I feel like I'm 20, you know. I'm like, does that change when you get older? And she goes, honey, I hate to tell you, it does not. You will always, mm. you always feel young. And, you know, with her being 99, she lays there on her deathbed and she reflects on her life her 99 is is one memory do you hear what i'm saying about time when when jesus says he's coming back and we have the mockers out there saying well he hasn't come back yet and we're 50 and we've heard this since we was a kid well people right. my 50 to the beginning of my time is a fleeting moment and that's what Jesus is giving Brother Marty to do, is to warn the people, your time, you're taking it for granted. Because I'm coming back, and when I do, everything is going to change. So he's given us this time period, this grace that we're in to do it. And I want to encourage us as the body of Christ with Marty we need to recognize the sobering of the times and we need to gather that moment. We're in a moment that God has given us to live. We get to live in yes. this. Yes. I mean, it's, it's horrible what's coming, but God chose you, you to live now. And we get to go out Amen. and make a difference. Amen. We can say, okay, Lord, we know all this is coming because it's written in your word and you chose us to live as the last generation going out. So what can I do to come out screaming, baby? I want to come out the gusto. You know what I'm saying? 
We want to go yes. out and say, yes, Lord. We want the harvest. So show us how we can help in all this scenario. So, yes, it is trauma. But it's also a beautiful story of God's mercy if we will recognize the day. And Marty, I got a word for you, brother. Amen. I for you when you first started talking, okay? That's why, Brian, when I have a guest and uh, you see me turn my head to do something, please don't think that I'm being disrespectful to my guest, okay? I'm not. It's because I'm either writing a word or sharing the broadcast or something. I'm not being disrespectful, okay? But here's your word, sir. Now, I just want to say that on the precipice of this, I've interviewed hundreds of ministers and heard life stories and how God did this and turned it around this. So this is what I feel for you about your life, Marty. Okay, uh, when you was on your deathbed, when you was in disobedience and you was not right with God and not living right, the devil attacked your oxygen. He attacked the very voice of who you are, okay? He tried to take you out by that because that is your calling, brother. Your Amen. oxygen, this is what I heard, okay? Your oxygen was low, but it represented like a ministry attack on your voice to shut down your voice. But now your very breath, God is using your breath to impact the world. God is good and God be the glory. And may he heal you all the way 100% so that you can finish your Amen. mission. We need you, Marty. The body of Christ Amen. needs you to finish your mission and to continue given these dreams and i want to pray for you while i'm under this anointing brother listen you i can just imagine the battle weariness of like whenever they was doing the broadcast and they was like everybody so tired and weary people don't know the weight of you carrying this on your shoulders of what is coming and god revealing this when god first showed me bright i said i don't want to know that's what i because right. when you know, then you're responsible. And then you have to be rejected. And I can see that, brother. You've been greatly rejected. Let's all come together in unity as the bride of Christ. Lord, we just come before you right now. And we lift up our brother to you, Lord. And we're together as the bride, as the church. And we're surrounding him, Lord. With your love, with your grace, and with your mercy, Lord. And we are locking arms in the spirit right now over our brother. Lord, first of all, we just want to pray. Life, Lord, for giving him a second chance and for healing him, Lord. It's so beautiful what you have done in his life. And Lord, thank you for speaking to him about coming back, Lord. And we, we cannot imagine, Lord, what this man has really been through and the trauma that his family has been through through this, Lord. And so we surround him with love right now, Lord, and we ask you, fill him with healing. Heal this man, Lord, from the top of his head to the soles of his feet right now. In Jesus' name, heal him. Anoint him, Lord. Fill him with your power and the Holy Ghost, Lord. Fill him with your glory, Lord, and use him with full maximum potential in these last days, Lord, with nothing, holding him back, Lord, giving him all the tools and strategies that he is going to need to fulfill the mission that you have called him to, Lord, giving him all of the money he's going to need, Lord, let him have donors, people that will sow into his family, Lord, we have seen the struggle, all of us that follow him, the struggle that he has been through this year with jobs and, and you're frustrating his path because you want him to do this full time. Lord, let the church step up. Let us step up and, and give him the money that he needs, Lord, to be able to fulfill this mission in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, give him intercessors, Lord. He needs intercessors because of the warfare that he is 
encountering in these dreams, Lord. His battle is not with flesh and blood, and we ask you, God, to give him all that he needs. Intercessors, give him the money for his family. Give him the house of his dreams. Give him all the things, Lord, that he needs to do this mission. Lord, give him the technology. Give him better internet. Lord, give him a better phone. Open up the doors wide for him, Lord. Have people see the beauty of what you have done in this man, Lord, by giving him favor in the body of Christ and favor with man, Lord. God, I pray you open up the doors for him to speak to the government about what is coming. Yes. And that he would be able to share his experience, Lord. He gave his time in our country of being a policeman and he, he helped mankind and everything. Lord, you, you are going to use all that, Lord, for your glory, for what's coming on the earth, Lord. Use, his, use him mightily, Lord, expanding his borders and opening up territories. That's what I see, opening up territories for him to be able to release this gift that you have given him, Lord, and we just praise you today that he is a blessing in the body of Christ, and we accept him, and we rebuke every lying devil and every spirit of rejection that has tried to enter due to mankind in their hearts. In Jesus' name, we're all in agreement, the bride. In Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Are you with me, brother? <laughs> Are you here? I, I think so. It should be a you hear me? Yes. Hey, I'm going to read you. I'm going to read you some of the comments that your uh, followers that love you are saying. First of all, I just saw one that said, God didn't bring you here for nothing, Marty. And he didn't heal your body and save you and show you all this stuff for nothing. So let me see what your people are saying. Okay, let me see here. Let me turn it down. All right. Okay, they're saying, Marty, they're saying, we're praying in agreement in Jesus' name. He didn't bring you this far, Marty, to let you fall. Brother, may the Lord Jesus be revealed through you. These are random people, Marty. Pour out your blessings upon him, Lord. Praying for you, Marty. Yes, Lord. Marty, we got a lot more for you than that's against you, sir. Are you here? I know it's breaking up. I can hear you trying. Yes, Miss Lisa, amen to that. May the Lord bless and keep Marty. Like I said, Bride, turn to make sure you go to his page and ask him to be your uh, friend. I'm going to put his name on here again to all of you new ones that signed in so you can follow him. Marty Breeden. That's his name for you to follow. Oh, uh, you've already got one intercessor. All right. That's awesome. Yes, Mary, please. Yes. Marty, you really do need intercessors because of the warfare that you go through to deliver these dreams. Yes, Tim says, God bless you, brother. I pray he gives you never-ending faith and wisdom. Amen. Yes, Marty, are you still with us, brother? Lord, bless Marty. Bless him, Lord. Are you here, Marty? 
I think you're there you are. Come on, Marty. Come back in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. I know it, Stacy. His screen is frozen. So Lisa, Marty, Lisa says she'll be a intercessor for you. Deb, Marty has been such a blessing to us. How could we not hold him up in prayers? Amen. God is good. Amen. Well, Robin, if you're still watching, he he would be a great uh, he would be a great guest for your show, Robin, because he has the, all these dreams all the time. Can anyone else see what I'm seeing on Marty's face? Oh, it's where it's pixelated. Uh, it's where it's pixelated is what it is. Well, let's pray for Marty's technology. Amen, Stacy. Let's pray. Lord, we pray right now that Marty's technology will work, Lord, that he will find better internet connection in Jesus' name, Lord, so that he can finish this broadcast. We rebuke every lying devil and every devil trying to prevent him from sharing the gospel. We rebuke you in the name of Jesus. We take dominion and authority over this broadcast. Thank you, Lord. Clear up the air. See, listen, bride, we are in a real war because our battle is not with flesh and blood. It's with the principalities and the powers of the air. Yes, he has an awesome, uh, awesome dreams all the time. And, Brian, I want to tell you something else about following him that's very unique. Not only does he share dreams, okay, but Marty has a history of um, serving the country as a police officer so and security duties and different things he's done. So he will share... Uh, what he sees, not just the dreams, but he shares what he sees. Like he'll say, I'm telling y'all, I see this coming. His latest one was about how the conservatives, they're going to come out fighting. They are going to get to the point where they've had enough and come out swinging. <laughs> so it's stuff like that, that uh, he will point to. Uh-huh. Amen, Stacy. That's right. Stacy said the devil didn't like it when you started praying for Marty. He needed it. Yes. I could tell that it touched Marty for sure. Yes, Lord. Bless Marty. Lord, give him the best of everything, Lord. Yes, Lord. And open up doors. And for him to even have a TV show. Come on now. Give him a TV show where he can share these dreams, Lord. Give him a staff of people that knows how to do all this stuff. Yes, Lord. I'm starting to hear you, Marty, but I can't. It's still pixelated. I can hear you trying to come back. But, Brad, listen. Uh, going back to what I was saying about the gloom and doom, uh, we need to have eyes wide open, okay? We need to pay attention uh, to prophets, what they say, and to people that give these dreams, and they're, they're trying to make the bride aware. Hey, I can see you better now. Oh, amen, Marty. Yes. Yes, it is, Judy. Amen. I can see you, Marty. I just can't hear you. Yes, come on now. Yes, Lord, let it work. Let it work. Yes, heal this broadcast, Lord. Yes, you're starting to come back, brother. I can hear you a little bit. Yes, 
It's still breaking up. Yes, amen, Judy, amen. Yes. Lord, open the skies. There you go for Marty's coverage. He'll, he'll tune back in in just a second. He'll come back in. And maybe that's what he needed uh, was to be able to come out and come back in. But going back to the gloom and doom, Bribe, we need to pay attention. Um, we need to be sober and alert. Amen. It's not easy, these people that have to speak these harsh words to the nation. It is not easy. Uh, they go through much rejection, much, especially from the church. Especially from the ones that are preaching the uh, seeker-friendly, uh, you know, seeker-friendly stuff. I call it the New Age Jesus, when they're teaching this New Age Jesus. Yes, amen, Judy. Don't give up. Amen. All right. Lord, let him come back on. Yes. Well, let me, I'm going to do something real quick while I'm waiting on him. I am going to look up his wall. And I am going to read you a few of his latest dreams. Marty, my connection continues to cut out. I'm so sorry. I've enjoyed my time with you, June, and all my brothers and sisters. Yes. Amen. All right. Amen. Well, uh, thank you so much, brother, for being with us. And we do appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being on Bride Time Live. Look. Well, you already gave me an hour and 20 minutes, Marty, and I appreciate it. You, I hope you go back and read these comments. Uh, there's over 100 or 200 comments, and these people are telling you, Marty, how much they love you and support you, brother. All right, Bribe, well, thank you so much for tuning in today. God bless you. I love you. This is Dr. June Knight from WATB.TV, which means... We are the bride. That's my ministry. Uh, you can see our website at WATB.TV, our radio at WATBradio.com. All right, bride. Thank you, and God bless you.